Welcome to the video everyone, today we're talking about lens compression, discussing why it doesn't actually exist, and also why that doesn't actually matter. The theory of lens compression is that using a longer focal length lens gives you a more flattering portrait look, and also can make your background appear bigger. Which is true, but that's not actually lens compression that's causing those. What people perceive to be lens compression is usually a mixture of three other scientific principles, namely perspective, angle of view, and depth of field. But the term lens compression implies that it's the lens that's doing the compressing of the scene, and that you can only get that look with a long focal length lens, you can't get it with a wide angle lens, which isn't true. So I'm going to show you some sample test shots to prove that that's not the case, and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of what is actually going on. So for this test shot, it's a very basic setup. I simply had this toy car on the desk here behind me. I then had an LED light panel against the back wall to act as a, a, a background, a frame of reference, if you like, to compare up to the car. I then had the camera situated across the room on a tripod. Now, the car was about three meters away from the camera and the light was about a meter behind the car, meaning it was about four meters away from the camera, and they never moved throughout the entire time. I then took a series of test shots, some shots at a 35 millimeter focal length and some shots at 150 millimeters. Now, the theory of lens compression would tell you that the shot with 150 mil would have more compression, that the light in the background should appear larger compared to the car than it does with the 35 mil. Well, here are the two sample test shots, and obviously straight away, the first thing you notice is that the angle of view that you get from the 35 mil is much wider, so you can see a lot more of the room. But if we crop into the 35 mil shot so that the car now appears to be the same size on the screen as the 150 mil test shot, you will notice the light in the background is identical in both shots. It's the same relative size compared to the car, and it's no more or less out of focus either. So what is actually going on here? Firstly, let's tackle the perspective argument. Now, perspective is how we perceive things. It's how an object will appear to the viewer depending on how we're looking at it. For example, take the 35 millimeter lens. If I hold it here, it appears to be this big. If I move it back here, it now appears to be much smaller. If I move it much closer towards you, it now appears to be much bigger. The physical size of the lens hasn't changed, but your perception of it has because the distance that you're viewing it from is constantly changing. But that's just the viewer to one object. If you then factor in another object and say, the 150 mil lens is significantly larger than the 35. But if I put this all the way back here and I move the 35 mil all the way up here, the 35 mil now appears to be bigger than the 150, even though we all know it's actually not. So the distances between your camera, your subject and the background can have a huge bearing on how big or small they appear relative to each other. The light panel in the background is actually physically bigger than the car in the foreground, but because the car is much closer, it appears larger than the light. Now, because we didn't move the camera when we changed the lenses over, the relative distances between the three objects remained consistent, so the relative perspectives remain the same as well. The only difference is the angles of view. The 35 mil, as we've already established, having a shorter focal length gives a wider field of view. Now, because it's producing a wider field of view, everything in the scene appears to be further away, so all of the objects appear to be smaller. But all the objects are still the same relative distances from each other, so even though everything appears to be smaller, everything gets smaller at a consistent rate. So when we then crop into the image to give us the same field of view that the 150 mil produces, we end up with the same looking image. The only difference being that the 35 mil shot cropped in is a much lower resolution because we've binned off most of the pixels. Now, we could have moved the camera closer to the desk when we were shooting with the 35 mil. This would have made the car appear bigger in the frame, and it also would have made the light in the background appear bigger as well because we're also moving the camera closer towards the light. However, the relative distances between them would have then changed. 
As I've already mentioned, the camera and the light were around four meters apart, and the car was situated three quarters of the way towards the light. Now, had we moved the camera two meters further forward to get the car the same size in the frame, the camera would have moved two meters closer to both the car and the light. However, the relative distances would now mean that the car was sitting halfway between the light and the camera, so it would now be relatively much closer to the camera than the light was. But that's perspective, not lens compression. It doesn't matter what focal length lens you use, the perspective is based on how far away the subjects are compared to each other. The only difference that using the longer focal length means is that you can narrow your angle of view optically rather than having to crop in, and you can then maintain a higher resolution. The final aspect that comes into play is depth of field, which leads me to one small caveat of information that I intentionally withheld until now which is that the two test shots, the 35 to the 150, was shot at different apertures. The 35mm was shot wide open at f1.8, while the 150mm test shot was stopped down to f8. Now, depth of field is calculated using the distance from your camera to the subject, i.e. how far away is the lens having to focus, the focal length of the lens that you're using, and the aperture that you're shooting at. Now, the aperture number, your f number, is a ratio of the focal length of your lens versus the diameter of the aperture opening. So simplify that down, and the only two factors that affect depth of field is actually the distance from the camera to your subject and how big is the iris diameter of your lens. The focal length of the lens doesn't really come into play. You can use any two focal lengths you like, and provided your focus distance remains the same, as long as the iris diameter is the same, both lenses will produce the same depth of field, which is what I did with the test shots before. To calculate the physical diameter of your iris opening, you take the focal length and you divide it by your aperture ratio. In this case, 35 mil divided by f1.8 gives you 19 and a half millimeters. So provided we shot the 150 mil focal length with the same physical iris diameter, you should get the same depth of field. Now, to calculate what f number will give you that, you divide your focal length by the iris opening. So 150 mil divided by 19.5 millimeters gives you 7.7. .7. So f7.7 .7 would give you 19 and a half mil iris opening at 150 mil. Obviously, we can't get exactly f7.7 .7 .7 because the cameras only go with either 7.1 or f8. So we shot the telephoto lens at f8 versus the wide angle at f1.8, and lo and behold, the light in the background is just as out of focus in both shots because the depth of field is near enough the same. And in theory, any focal lengths can match up. I could shoot that lens at 600mm f6.3. That would give me an iris diameter of 95mm. Hypothetically, I could get the same depth of field from a 16mm lens, but in order to do that, the 16mm lens would need to be an f0.16 lens, which I don't think we're quite yet at a point of seeing one of those on the market. But if it did exist, the depth of field that it produced at f0.16 would be the same as a 600mm at f6.3. So if you were to get like an ultra high resolution camera, say, 200 megapixels, slap an ultra wide angle lens with a really fast aperture on it, you could get the exact same look with that cropping in very heavily as if you'd shot with a low resolution camera on a telephoto lens shot at a very narrow aperture. In theory, the idea of taking an ultra high resolution camera with a wide angle lens at a fast aperture and cropping in to a single image is just the reverse of the method that I can't remember the name of, whereby you can use a longer focal length shot at a reasonably wide aperture and take multiple images and stitch them all together to give you the look of a really wide angle lens with an ultra thin depth of field. The two ideas are the same principle, just done in the reverse of each other. The difference is we have access to relatively fast telephoto lenses to stitch a lot of shots together, we don't have access to ultra high resolution cameras with ultra fast wide angle lenses to be able to crop in a single image, yet. But all of this is pointless theory because 
it's all irrelevant anyway. Even if there was ultra high resolution cameras on the market, nobody in their right mind is gonna sink thousands of pounds into buying one to then sell all their telephoto lenses and just walk around with one fast wide angle lens and crop into all of the pictures. It's never gonna happen. So now that I've wasted 10 minutes of your time with that information, if you have any questions or queries, feel free to leave them in the comment box down below. If you enjoyed this video or somehow found it useful, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button and hopefully we'll see you in the next video. I've got to wake you up or your fan club will be unhappy.